Hello, YouTube theologians. Pastor Wolf Mueller here, here with Dr. Schultz, who's re written and published. I have, this is not a, can you, is it even, is it backwards? Or something? Anatomy of an Implosion, one pastor professor's diagnosis and lament of the mission drift to woke Marxism in Lutheran higher education. Dr. Schultz, welcome back. Good to see you again. It's been a while. Well, thanks, Pastor. Always my pleasure. It's, always, it's my fault, by the way, you guys who are watching and listening, because Dr. Schultz, is, he loves to come and visit, and I'm always busy with other nonsense, so it's a start. <laughs> but I'm glad to have you back, and congratulations on, on the publication of the book. You, it's, a, it's, it's somewhat autobiographical, because this is not, I mean, you, you had a chance to observe what you're talking about up close. Do you want to give a, just a thumbnail sketch of what's happened the last few years? Well, uh, thanks, brother. So I think I'd resist the thought that it's very much autobiographical. What I'd like to offer is that it is, um, I hope, a very faithful pastor professor's view of what's been going on at our Concordia universities in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, and beyond in conservative Lutheran education. Um, and uh, what what perhaps is unique about it is that you know, there's a first-person familiarity with things. So I'm in the front row um, for some of the stuff that's been happening. Uh, the very brief, in a nutshell, uh, description of things is that um, about two years ago, Concordia University, Wisconsin, uh, the, the unofficial way of talking about that university is that it's the flagship university for our Concordia system. For uh, your listeners who are uh, extraordinarily well informed, I know, but who may be uh, listening in right now, we uh, love to confuse things by causing calling every single institution that we in the LCMS have Concordia. So you really have to be sure you're having a nice back and forth conversation and say, well, which Concordia? So all the universities co and uh, formerly colleges used to be called, are called Concordia. Our seminaries have Concordia. Um, so this is Concordia University, Wisconsin, which is located um, just up the shoreline on Lake Michigan from Chicago uh, in Mequon, Wisconsin. It also has an extended campus in uh, Michigan. So what was happening about two years ago is that the um, former president of some 20-some years had announced his retirement and there was a search underway for a new president. In the process of that, that search, um, there was a very public posting uh, defining the qualities. This was actually the terminology that was used, the important qualities which um, the next president would have to fulfill. And those qualities actually described the three terms that we know now as die. Um, most people do DEI, but I'm playing around a little bit with it. So diversity, inclusion, and equity. And uh, the quotes can be found at the head of my book and, and probably all over the place online. But they were looking for a new university professor who would believe in and be committed to racialized diversity, inclusion, which means inclusion of everything actually except uh, the the Christian and Western worldview on things, and equity, a um, word which is a, a very nasty substitute for equality under the law to talk again about uh, ratios of people based on their uh, self-identified race or self-identified sexual predilections or whatever. So this, this announcement uh, was online for the, a span of two years, 2021 into 2022, um, being a professor, not to mention a uh, confessional Lutheran pastor in our LCMS Synod, I did my best to talk with um, the Board of Regents when they were doing strange things. Glad to talk about that if we need to. And uh, tried to talk with the administration and anybody else who would listen. And ultimately, um, I, I realized that nobody was going to uh, to stop the momentum of this push for the woke president. So I published an essay in Christian News called Woke Dysphoria at Concordia. Uh, the reaction to that um, published essay, along with the published open letters I'd been sending to the board and so forth, um, was not what I was hoping for when I called for repentance and pointed out what a 
a horrible business this wokeness is for education. I identified it as, you know, kind of a potent progressivism and neo-Marxism and postmodernism and so forth. And it's also just in, in diametric contest, contrast to Christ and his gospel. Uh, so the reaction of the university was summarily to ban me from campus without uh, any procedure. Um, I was locked out, locked out of the system, prohibited from stepping on campus. Uh, long story short, the university uh, under its interim president and with the uh, compliance of its board uh, went after me for the better part of a year after that while I was not allowed on campus and not allowed to teach and actually according to their verbiage prohibited from having contact with my colleagues or students or or anything pretty ridiculous considering I usually preach and uh, teach Bible classes and help with liturgy in the surrounding congregations. This whole business uh, garnered an awful lot of national attention from people concerned with academic freedom, which is another topic I'm happy to talk about, especially in connection with Lutheran uh, disputation and teaching. Uh, but um, so the the process went on for over a year to try to get me, um, I think quite frankly, to get me um, fired, but also uh, to infer that by the way they were speaking about one or two Bible passages, I had done something truly horrible and couldn't be around students or human beings and really should crawl under a rock and die. Um, so uh, I went through um, all of that business and with uh, some protection from the uh, Wisconsin Institute for Law and Liberty on the civil side of things, uh, went through another year, uh, a little bit less, and now there's a new administration on board. The new administration is has indicated its commitment to um, taking me back if and only if I will agree that they can fire me at any time they want for whatever reason or no reason whatsoever by the senior administrators, the president and the provost. Now, the problem here, I think, and I know you just asked for the summary, but the problem here is you could say multi-layered or nested. There are some very obvious things. The, the sheer malice wrongness and probably illegality of handling a professor the way the university has manhandled me. That's the least of it. The other problems, though, are um, Concordia has established itself as being an institution according to national legal organizations at Princeton and, and where else, um, as being an uh, institution that really is not living up to the name of being a university because it will not allow criticism of the university um, and what it's doing. Won't even allow discussion of that. Now, furthermore, that tips over then onto the church side of things. So you and I know this very well, but just to remind your, your uh, viewers and listeners about it, uh, we are actually, you and I as uh, called and ordained pastors, we're responsible to do as, for instance, the scriptures say and our Lutheran confessions demand of us that we must believe, teach, and confess everything that Scripture says, nothing more or less. And uh, this is actually a quote, uh, as that was. This is actually a quote from our Formula of Concord. And to um, reject and condemn false doctrine, false dogma is the word there. So that's actually what I was doing and calling for repentance. There is, of course, a longer story in there with how church leaders reacted, what's going on back and forth. Um, but... Uh, this is, I think, a story and uh, a concern and a problem and a worry which has both a civil kind of academic side to it and what's more important for you and me and probably most of your listeners, it has this uh, doctrinal question. Is a university of the church, such as Concordia University, Wisconsin, completely beholden to the word of God and then, by the way, to the faithful uh, confessions of Luther and the Reformers and the creeds. Are they completely beholden to that, or are they free to do whatever they feel they need to do to be a university the way they understand it? All of this comes to a focus, I think, <clears throat> in uh, my saying, bless you, in my no, saying you. that um, what's actually at issue here is uh, a matter of doctrine, which um, I, I think most of us have seen 
anyone who's interested. I want to, That's what I want to dig down on. But just one quick thing. So you mentioned how um, the university isn't living up to that name university, which is that yeah. s- that kind of seeking for that one truth. And and you mentioned the kind of promises that they all mention. Uh, Princeton and so forth, but you, I think you would say rightly that it's not like Concordia isn't living up to that while all the other universities are. I mean, this is a problem that's throughout higher education, that it's it's been captivated by an ideology that's that's militating against the seek the the seeking after of truth and and the freedom to seek after it. Right. Well, let's take an example here. So you and I are talking um, in in Epiphany, which is, you know, right after the Christmas season in 2024. Uh, It's January 2024 as we're visiting. Now, this is right after the uh, three university presidents from Princeton, MIT, and Harvard were in front of a congressional committee. And we've recently learned that the president of Harvard uh, had to resign from her position there because of what you could call this woke Marxism stuff. So her conclusions, um, such as they were, led her actually to say in front of God, Congress, and everybody uh, that it, it was not a, uh, immoral to be calling for the genocide of the Jewish people. And, and more things. She simply would not speak to that. So you're certainly right that this woke Marxism, which uh, no doubt we'll, we'll define and exemplify a bit more in our conversation, as we always do, um, but this woke Marxism is pervasive. But here's the thing. Uh, it should not be pervasive in religious universities. And in fact, I'd be happy to make the argument, one of Concordia University, Wisconsin's biggest failures in going after me the way they did is their failure to be an option for parents around the country, perhaps the world, who want a place to entrust their sons and daughters to where they will not be taught the oppressor, oppression, um, made-up mantra, the mythology of Harvard's critical race theory. But Concordia University is finding itself right now in the position of defending its right to do whatever it wants to do, while at the same time seeking to silence a professor and a pastor of the church who's saying, wait a minute, this is contrary to our own religious commitments, our own confessional identity. Right. I I think the same thing is true with churches. Just in in the very broad swath of things, you have Lutheran churches trying to be like evangelical churches, and it's not like we have a shortage of evangelical churches. I mean, let them do that, I suppose. I mean, they should also be Lutheran, but we should probably do the only thing that we are called to do, which is to be Lutheran. I mean, that's the the only thing that Lutheran churches are good at is being Lutheran, and we're not even that good at that. And apparently it's true of our universities as well. So... Well, let's, let me add something that we both want to say here. You can tell me if you don't agree. I know you do, though. Um, our thing as Lutherans, uh, and this is not a, not a dismissal of our, our congregational life, our big thing is education. Uh, you know, you and I both have a heart for mission work, too, uh, but our mission work fundamentally has been education in the United States of America, in the world, in our history. We are a university faith. We come from the University of Wittenberg. Um, so the, the, the problem then, it, to put it this way for maybe a broader audience, I don't know, but the problem is that our universities are, number one, the feeder schools for most of the students into our seminaries. And number two, if our universities were doing, should be providing, sending out professors and so forth, to back up and sustain and help the parish pastors and their people on the front lines. So when this whole education thing falls apart, or if you will, to use the biblical thought, when the trumpet, the shofar, doesn't give a clear sound, right? When we are are not different from all of the other universities in the United States, we have failed at our mission to the church also. Hmm. 
thank you. You, uh, you, I, I want to dig in, especially this, the language of woke Marxism. So that this is kind of yeah. my goal for the conversation. That I, I, I want to be able to. I, I, sm I think I mentioned to you before we started, I can smell how the whole thing is woke Marxism, but I can't argue it. I can't say how what we're seeing here is connected to Marxism and what the unique... So, so Marxism as a broad category, woke as a specific um, smaller circle in that broader category. So, so, can we, um, so you have to broaden Marxism out as a category for me so that the woke fits into it. So could we start there with Marxism and... and, and define the term and the history there. Right. So um, the book that we're talking about, Anatomy of an Implosion, is not, strictly speaking, an academic book, though it is all about academics. It, it's not the kind of book that I'm used to writing where you've got a zillion footnotes and it's written for, well, mostly an academic audience or it's going to be used in a, a graduate course or something. Um, this is meant to be very accessible to our pastors and people in the parishes to see what the concern is. And uh, your, your request for a clear definition is, of course, exactly one of the things that we desperately need in this entire conversation where we can have it, uh, but are not getting, uh, practically not getting anywhere. Our own church has been dallying more broadly with condemning people even for asking questions online about woke things that are entering into some of our publications and conversations. So this this is a big deal. Now I'm going to offer the thought that what I'm doing, you may regard this as a little sloppy or a little sloshy, uh, but I just said it's not strictly an academic book. So woke is the popular term. Marxism is the more um, focused term. So I'm going to say that I needed to use both of those together to, to explain to people that this is all the same thing. So I could have said, you know, this is one pastor professor's concern for the neo-Marxism infecting our institutions. And I don't think people would recognize it as what is also described as woke. So I've said in the book a couple times that actually this is a hydra-headed thing. The different heads have different names. Um, ultimately, we'd be able to say that the phenomenon we're talking about here is LGBTQism, that it is the social justice movement, the so-called racial justice movement. It is wokeness, the way it had usually been described in uh, grade school or board of education conversations. So let me just um, follow your lead and, and do what you're asking for. The term woke is nothing more or less than an effort to talk about things happening now going downhill as if they were actually enlightened instead of benighted. So think back to the term enlightenment. The enlightenment, um, European enlightenment, uh, would be, for instance, the stuff going on around the time of the Declaration of Independence and the Revolution in the United States. Immanuel Kant is pretty much at the, the head of this academically and in a writing way. You folks could look up um, a very accessible especially for him, a very accessible essay online, What is Enlightenment? But all we need right now is to catch that word enlightenment. Oh, what a wonderful marketing word, right? So, Professor Kant, uh, it, it's pretty clear that you want to be able to do philosophy and thought and politics and civilization utterly apart from Christ and the Bible, without mentioning the name of Christ, without depending on the authority of the Bible. This seems like a pretty bad thing to be doing. And, and he'll say, oh, well, my dear fellow, um, actually what this is, is it's enlightenment. We're finally growing up. We're going to be adults. We're going to stand on our own two feet. Doesn't that sound wonderful? Uh, enlightenment was the term of art, still is, for acting as if Christ and the Bible never existed. Woke is the same thing. It's exactly the same thing, only, I'm going to go ahead and say it, a lot less educated a um, lot less thoughtful, a lot, lot less concerned about making the case. It's simply something that, that imposes itself on us. Wokeism actually is somnabulism, if you want to do something here. It's actually a way to put people to sleep. So instead of being enlightened, 
the Enlightenment darkened the source of salvation, wisdom, and full understanding of the value of each and every human being. That's what it was really doing. Wokeism is putting people to sleep so the government or bad actors or administrators who perhaps don't know what they're doing, that's my most charitable read, where they can visit something on us and it sounds, oh, kind of benign, kind of harmless, and even kind of nice. Uh, do, do students at your university sleep through their classes or are they wide awake and woke? Now, Marxism then comes in because that is the, what? That's the spin, that's the way this is all rifled as it hits us. And as it, especially, and, and um, this is why it's to be opposed, especially the way it's assaulting our children and our grandchildren. So Marxism is something that um, is, I think, very apparent in everything that's going on. You could catch this, I think, in an easy-to-read way by taking a look at Solzhenitsyn. So I, I don't mean, you know, reading all his three volumes of the Gulag Archipelago, the worst things could happen, but I mean catching his essay online. The one we've all heard the title of, I think, Live Not by Lies. And look at this man, uh, 1974, coming out of being a prisoner in the Gulag in the Soviet Union, warning like a prophet, right? Warning the West, you're headed for the very same thing that's going on with the communism in the Soviet Union. You, le you need not to live by lies. Take a look at that, and, and I think you'll see the Marxism almost automatically. But, uh, you know, I'm one of those people who um, can speak about this, I think, with some familiarity and authority. So this has to do with German idealism. Here's the very quick version. This picks things up with that story about the Enlightenment. So after Immanuel Kant did everything he could to teach people to do without the Bible and to do without Christ, I think it's it looks pretty often like Kant thinks seriously thinks he can have all the good stuff apart from Christ and apart from the Bible. His his um, ethics actually turns out to be kind of a secularized version of the golden rule, which is actually a quote from our Lord, right? Do to others as you would have them do to you, which doesn't work if you don't know and remember and keep on listening to the voice that's speaking that, which is the voice of the incarnate God. So um, uh, Kant was seriously trying to do that. It, it's all quite horrible and obviously devastating as time goes on. But after the Enlightenment and Immanuel Kant comes a uh, philosopher by the name of Hegel, and Hegel goes with Kant's notion of departing from Scripture, getting rid of that that uh, bothersome crutch of the Bible in Western culture, and Hegel actually teaches philosophy as if it were mythology. You've got to put something in there to bring some sort of authority, or if you will, some sort of grip and persuasion to this message about uh, how how society is getting better and better. And um, so what he did was what uh, J. Glenn Gray calls philosophical mythology. Now, Hegel then, uh, in writings such as, um, well, well, in a number of his writings, they're, they're pretty hard uh, things to get through. I recommend looking at Hegel, for those who want to read, looking at the website Squashed Philosophers, Squashed Philosophers, and you'll find some of Hegel's stuff blessedly abbreviated and introduced sometimes even with a little bit of humor to help you remember what he's up to. Um, so Hegel was teaching teaching this, and now here's the reason I mentioned Hegel in our short conversation right now. A major follower of Hegel was Karl Marx. Karl Marx, at, at a point where we might think of him as being um, well along in high school or starting off his college career, just decided that he was going to abandon his uh, Christian upbringing and he was going to follow Hegel, which he did. He took Hegel's um, basic thought that society gets better and better by a process of thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. You know, there's a unifying idea for a cult culture or society. Then somebody comes up with the opposite and as the result 
of the collision of those two opposite ideas, you get a better synthesis, and so society gets better and better and better, by which he meant more communist, probably. Um, so anyhow, Marx picks that up, and we know this. Marx is just repurposing Hegel when he, Marx, says, okay, here's what I'm going to say, and this is all made up. Society is composed fundamentally of two different classes, and in his case, it was the bourgeoisie. We're even saying that today sometimes thoughtlessly, the bougie people, right? The owners, the rich people, the, the movers and the shakers. And then there's the proletariat, the poor working schmucks. And the bourgeoisie is taking away the meaningfulness and the identity and the money from the proletariat. So the proletariat needs to rise up and in kind of a, a Hunger Games version of Yahtzee, right? You got to roll the dice and, and take this over. And then, of course, we're going to get a better, and Marx says it, communist society. That's what? communism. That's communism in, in kind of a nutshell. And that's, that's the, what I'm saying here. There's another element we can come to as well. If, if communism, you know, the synthesis for Hegel, like the, you know, the thesis, antithesis, and then synthesis, and then that synthesis yeah. becomes the new thesis, which has an antithesis. Well, did, did Marx sort out, I'm just curious, like what would, when communism went from being the synthesis to the thesis, what would be the antithesis? And the next, did he work through the next iteration of that or no? I'm going to say no. I, I suppose some people who are fans of Marx will say he did work it out, but Marx was um, careless, philosophically careless, and just intellectually uh, hasty because he wanted to change things. So that that's some of the most famous kind of verbiage from him. I don't just want to teach people things. He doesn't just want to be a philosopher. He wants to change society. Now, please notice the overarching thing here is Kant, with the start of the Enlightenment, gets rid of the authoritative word of God and Christ. That's how they're doing things. Hegel picks this up, and with a ridiculous amount of output, um, Hegel puts down the individual, um, exalts society or nation states or whatever, and he keeps God so far out of this that he ha he's known for teaching dialectical materialism. That means dialogues, uh, writings, thinking for him um, absolutely positively denies entrance to Christ. You may not use the scriptures. You cannot talk about Christ. We're doing materialism here. That's what Marx picks up, and then he makes it more violent. So instead of just ideas automatically colliding and automatically somehow producing better societies toward perfect freedom, that's Hegel, uh, Marx says, well, you know, we need people to clash. We need some real violence here to make real change. And that's the inheritance that I see in what I'm calling woke Marxism. I'm, I'm hardly the only person who's doing that. No, but, that's right. Uh, I'm, I'm concerned with that biblical censorship in there. You see, when yeah. you say woke Marxism, you are saying a way of education or a way of life or a way of discourse in the United States, for instance, that will not allow any reference to the authority of Scripture uh, which is the word of Christ incarnate. I'm going to try to summarize it and see if I get it in my yeah. very oversimplified way, but it, it occurs to me that nobody is calling it woke Hegelianism or yeah. woke Kantianism, although I suppose this is what the point that you want to make, is that Marx includes those three. So the three moves are Kant says, hey, we want to think without Christ, and Hegel picks that up and says that all there is is matter, but it it is moving in a mythological way. There's a progress that's happening in history, some sort of mystical material progress. And Marx says, right, and we are part of that progress. And to accomplish that, he divides people up. And it's that division of people, uh, the, the division of classes, I think that is the main thing that we're picking up now because it's not, because woke Marxism is not identifying people necessarily by simply economics, but you sort of pick your pick your line. We want to make sure that everybody is divided from everyone. So there's there's um, there's a battle between men and women. There's a battle between um, uh, between 
racial minorities and majorities. There's a battle between, um, I, I suppose, any minority, sexual minority or whatever, so that the woke part is expanding the the divisions. Is that is that right? Yes, let's also catch this. I, I meant to drop in the words that I did before. So when Hegel operates on the basis of mythology, that's, of course, a return to things before the fullness of time when God came. So it's a return to paganism, right? So how do you motivate people? How do you explain things? You do it by myths. Now, uh, I want to make it clear that Marx was being mythological when he divided up society economically. People, people think it's an economic argument, and it, that's not the heart of it. The heart of it is that he arbitrarily divided people according to an identity that he imposed. And then he got everybody riled up and set them at each other's throats. That's the heart of Marxism. It's so opposed to Christ that it wants to avoid even the understanding that you need to love your neighbor, you know, even as an aspiration. So um, what, what is Marxist about woke Marxism is the mythological character of it. The critical race theory sponsored by, lived by, worshipped by Harvard, and now by just about everybody else, is totally made up. There's nothing there. There's nothing there except this willfulness not to consult Christ, not to consult the sacred texts such as the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution in our country, and, and to do what powerful people want to do to the rest of us. And in some utterly perverse way, we seem happy to join in, at least on some elements of that, which is to join in on that project. Can you... So, so p pick up the story then in the philosophical conversation where critical theory enters into it, because... Uh, I, I, you, I mean, I think three years ago, and I would have saw, seen critical theory, and I would not have seen it with a capital C, capital T as a term, a technical term. Yes, uh, it has been a technical term for a long time, but I just, I just missed it. So, so can you flow that stream into the whole deal? I think I can. How about if I try to be a little briefer here, and then you tell me where we'd we'd like to expand it if we need to. So, uh, critical, just as the word woke or enlightenment by themselves are perfectly wonderful parts of the divine gift of language, right? I mean, th these are nice words. However, in our day and age, when conversation doesn't happen, when people are put into prison for trying to have conversations, when professors are, are hounded and fired just for trying to have conversations about what is right and wrong, right? In this day and age, very often all people get is a, a quick micro sound bite of a word. And that's, that's where I'd like to caution things. So w everybody should do with the term critical what you and I are endeavoring to model in our conversation, and that is stop and practice the first act of the mind. What does that term critical mean? What does it mean in this conversation? What does it mean when you see it in the paragraphs and the sentences and the books, right? And the, the fact of the matter is that critical has become a technical term for Marxist. So I don't mean to base what I'm saying on, on just Googling things online. I know that's a problem too. Uh, but if a person were to look at the etymology of critical, it fundamentally means to judge, to judge or discern. And that would seem like it's a pretty good thing. But the word has been co-opted. So I'm, I'm going to say it's been um, kind of, kind of rebaptized for a particular nasty purpose. So we always have to stop down, s slow down. And I've even uh, been recommending that we need to find a different vocabulary for what we want to talk about there. So the word critical traces back at least to the Frankfurt School, beginning of the 20th century, which was an effort to um, make the entire world communist. The very thing that's going on and has been going on with the European Union uh, since then. In fact, it kind of looks like those same folks and their disciples just decided they have to be more patient to turn everything global and communist, right? Okay, so critical then is a way of saying thinking according to critical theory, which is the view that there is no God, the scriptures are a tool of oppression or propaganda, religion is the opiate of the people, 
right? All of that stuff. And then to do your thinking that way. So what, what I actually do, Brian, is I've been, um, I've been teaching recently. I'm doing this a lot on uh, Lutheran philosopher. The kind of thinking that we need to develop is not, now remember these are quick little sound bites, is not critical thinking, but it should be crucial thinking. So um, I, I've uh, adopted the, uh, the slogan that we'd like you to join us at, at our online platform on Lutheran Philosopher to practice clear, crucial, and Christian thinking as an antidote to the Enlightenment and the woke stuff. So I think that the word crucial, which after all means having to do with the cross, that's the kind of thinking that we are in need of, uh, a thinking which is not so censorious, so cowardly, um, and so vicious at the same time that it wants to pre-censor the word of God from people. I mentioned that we're talking uh, at the time that we are here in, in January of 2024. We're just after the Iowa caucuses, and I'm not making a political observation here, though I think that conversation is fine too. Uh, but in the aftermath of, of an overwhelming um, indication about uh, a candidate for the president, all sorts of people on TV, on the uh, legacy or corporate medias, media sites, are talking about the um, misrepresentation of the vote in the Iowa caucus because there's a preponderance of Christians and Bible-believing people and evangelicals in Iowa. Hmm. Okay? So that is all critical theory speaking, that whole business. Why should the Bible? What, what does this mean when our country is founded on the proposition that all men have been endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights? What does it say if a whole swath of people are, are publicly saying and teaching that we must not pay attention to any of this God and Bible stuff because it's just horrible. And then they, then they pile in their mythology, right? Because it's white supremacy. All Christians are white. <laughs> um, you know, and, and so forth and so on, right? So I think that we need to replace in our common conversation, though I'm not one for giving up words just because people are abusing them. But in our, our quicker conversations, I think the term that we want is crucial. So we want clear, crucial and Christian thinking. Um, I'll give you a chance to, to get at that, but first let me just throw in a quick anecdote. I had a professor in my um, philosophy uh, doctoral program who was from Chile orig originally. And um, every once in a while, you can imagine, philosophy discussions like, like ours could get a little, uh, a little dicey and also a little confused by everybody saying and talking past each other. And he said, wait a minute. He said, uh, you know... Uh, in my home country, when conversations got confused and people were talking past each other and getting angry and maybe even feeling violent toward each other, um, our parents used to say, wait a minute, speak Christian. Hmm. How about <laughs> that? That's so um, this, is, this is what woke Marxism <laughs> is out to, to destroy utterly and eternally. If they could, they can't. But this is, uh, this is what a lot of people are falling into. I so two things. That, so first, you mentioned the three acts of the mind, the first act of the three acts of the mind. I, and yeah. we've talked enough to where I finally figured out what that is. It should. Be, it's like the, so I so just to kind of backfill everyone because I was oh three acts of the mind. I love lists like that. It's basically the word and the sentence and the paragraph. It's the yeah. it's the it's the meaning of a thing. It's so it's a it's a it's a thing word. It's a an assertion, a sentence, and it's an argument, a paragraph. So. So those three acts of the mind are to, to define and to express and then to, to reason. Uh, at least that's how I'm summarizing those. And so you have to start with the, what's the if you don't have the right words, then you can't you talk past each other. Then your assertions that has to do with your 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 principled understanding of truth. And then how do you reason out from that? And how do you make those things together? And you can make errors at every level, which by the way is why and this is the second point why you are very you you always push me uh dr schultz and and, and i i finally f i've been trying to put my finger on it and then in your last answer 
I think I really put my finger on why. Because if I would have, if you asked me, hey, what's critical theory? And I would have said, well, critical theory assumes a, there's an invisible structure in the world of oppression and oppressor, and, and you can't see it because you're not woke, but I'm going to show it to you. It's a, this kind of Gnostic reality that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring you into. And I don't think you would disagree with that. But you start by saying it's, it's the assumption that there is no God or Scripture. <laughs> and, it, and, it, and that just, I don't know if this is helpful for those who are watching or for you, to, but that, the, the, you, so you're starting, you, you are always starting with the truth of Christ and putting everything against that. And that is taking every thought captive to Christ. And it's, it's, it's wonderful, but it's hard because that's not normally where we start. So yeah. anyway, I just, I just figured out one of the reasons why um, I enjoy our conversation so much and why they're always so challenging to me. So I don't know if you have thoughts on that. Well, I enjoy our conversations too, and I think they're wonderfully challenging. I, I also love the thought, brother, that um, we're having a substantial conversation about the most important things, and we are taking a stand against the woke flood and against the Marxist mythology and saying, no, um, we are logos beings who have been created by a Lord who revealed himself as the Lugas, and that word means language. Um, what, what, what's happening is we're being tricked into surrendering the gift of language. Uh, when, when institutions like Concordia University, Wisconsin, go for all this woke stuff, and it's mostly a top-down thing from the administrations and from the board. Uh, when this sort of stuff is going on, uh, it is stultifying, it is uh, hampering the work of the gospel by interfering with our humanity. We should be able to be having conversations like you and I are having right now all the time and everywhere. I, I also would just observe if, um, you know, one of our, our more gifted pastors like you can say, I wasn't familiar with the three acts of the mind for all of the other blessings that we got through our education coming up and in seminary, um, this was some pre-censoring that was carried over there too. So the, the antipathy, the hatred toward classical texts is also, of course, a hallmark of enlightenment and woke, quote-unquote, thinking. Um, this is why, as you know very well, um, this is why we've been adding... Um, words to try to make this clear. We are Lutherans. Yes, we're confessional Lutherans. Yes, that means we speak in line with texts, especially the scriptures. And we are also classical <laughs> confessional Lutherans, which is to say we are not going to give up these texts, which can serve us um, by helping us to talk about, to do our theology and do our teaching of the sacred and always authoritative, efficacious words of Scripture. But, of course, that's what's been happening. And I'm just going to throw this in there. I think a huge part of the problem here is that we have uneducated administrators and board members. Well, I think these are, these are not people who read. They're, they're not people who have taught in the classroom or pastored in congregations for decades like we have. They don't know the power of the word, they haven't been obliged. I hope you don't mind my saying this for both of us. You know, when we get out of bed in the morning as a parish pastor, you got to do the Bible. You, 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 can't, you can't not do it. Um, so they, they haven't been through this. They're just a bunch of people who have been administrators. And what are they administrating? I don't know. They're administrating administrations. Um, and and it's, quite, it's, quite a, it's quite a plague, actually. I don't. It, I think it's so. I don't think it's anything new. Uh, the, 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 I, now, my always, my imagination is always to say, well, okay, where do we find these things also in the Bible? So we we have yeah. a, a great mutual friend, uh, Warren Graf, who yeah. who loves to talk about how the Baal worshippers were Marxist, you know, uh, and I, I and I love that, and I know the historians and maybe the philosophers don't like to make that move, but if I can find it in the scripture, I, I always. I'm always doing this exercise, 
which is probably a first act of the mind exercise, is to say, okay, how would I take this term and speak of it using only biblical words? So how, how, would I, how would I use the language of the scripture to define this? And I don't want to say that that's necessary. I mean, we, we, can, we can use words that aren't in the Bible, of course. That's not, I'm not, but as, an ex, as a mental exercise, how would I limit myself? How would I constrain myself to what the scriptures give me to talk about this? And I think that that's really helpful with critical theory as well. It's that we are, um, that there is a, there's a wall of partition. This is how Paul talks in Ephesians 2. Mm-hmm. There's a wall of partition that, that the flesh builds up between whatever, between, he, he, he puts up a bunch of categories there, between male and female, between Jew and Gentile, between slave and free, so that we're always building up a, a wall of partition between the sexes, between the economic groups, between different races, and that Christ is the one who's tearing down that wall. And it seems to me like this, especially the diversity business of, of DEI, DIE is is trying to rebuild the wall of separation that the flesh always wants to build, but that Christ has torn down. How would you, how would you take that up or criticize that um, analysis? Well, that's exactly right, Pastor. Um, so, the the uh, probably the heart of anatomy of an implosion is uh, my analysis of the philosophy of language that is being adopted by woke. Marxist institutions and administrators and so forth. Um, that's probably something that will come up for a, a longer discussion later on. And um, I'm not going to pass up the chance to say that that our uh, mutual friend Warren is one sharp cookie for, for whom we're both and more people should be very grateful. So he had actually recommended to me, speaking about getting a little bit more literate on this stuff, which we all could stand to work at, uh, he recommended to me the anthology The Great Lie, uh, which may or may not be over my left shoulder here. Um, so uh, his, I think his insight is exactly right. Uh, what, we, what we also need, though, from time to time is um, less evocative and powerful preachers and speakers than Warren to do some of the uh, connecting the dots. And I think maybe that's the more modest work that I can help with. So uh, when... When St. Paul talks about that, um, that barrier and that, that Berlin Wall built up you know, between those different categories of people, um, St. Paul is combating woke Marxism because these made-up categories are what are killing us. This is how the woke Marxists are doing their damage. This is how they are achieving the mutilation of our sons and daughters and and you and I are not being hyperbolic or overstating that too dramatically that's exactly what's going on but the the means in the middle of all of this is the means of language so uh, mm-hmm. let me just elaborate a point here and see if that both reinforces your observation let me know if you don't think it does and and also helps our conversation to continue and that is uh, the the categories of sexual preference are not biblical categories. Right. The the notion of of uh, LGBTQ and you've got to go etc. M O U S E isms in there, right? Um, that is simply and obviously a continual Marxist project to get people mad and murderous with each other. Uh, sexual proclivity is not the issue. The issue is, of course, what is healthy and right and what have we been created for and what does God say about us Uh, the the notion of race is also socially constructed it's mythological in in scripture when we hear about race it's about the human race when we hear about nations it's whether the nations are in line with God or opposing him when we hear about peoples um, that is not some sort of color quota that's being evoked there. It's the universality of the gospel. So um, a, good, a good resource to look at to think that through, though I don't think that this resource goes far enough, as I say in the book, is uh, the Dallas Statement, where our evangelical neighbors 
um, have pointed out, and, and maybe it matters to some folks, that this is being done by people of different uh, racial appearance, too, uh, to point out, well, no, uh, racism is a is a, a great evil, but systemic racism and the way this is being construed is just anti-biblical. And then they give the passages, you know, to show that sort of thing. So um, education is an important thing here. Let's say that for this conversation, though, it seems that our key word is probably authority. Hmm. So where does the authority rest? Uh, alarmingly, we also have to have the conversation or part of the conversation being, is there such a thing as authority today? Marxism denies that. It depends on it. Marxism is all about an unending revolution. Think about things in Cuba, you know, closer to our shores and maybe our experience here. Uh, but it's constant revolution. Revolution against what? I think you could make a case that it's revolution against our human nature and human being, but it's fundamentally an argue an argument, no, a, a bloody revolution. I don't mean that in the British sense. I mean a lot of blood is spilled. A bloody revolution against the authority of Christ. People are, are, are dying and being killed. And uh, I, think, I think it's, you know, I say it, they're being imprisoned in the United States too because of their commitment to the authority of Christ. Is it possible, do you think, that the real reason for the cry of the genocide of the Jewish people today in our universities, primarily, right, uh, such as Harvard and so forth, is it possible that that is fundamentally a revolt against the authority of the Bible? Because our Jewish neighbors, I'm well aware that some can be reformed, non-religious Jews, and some are religious. But the Jewish people are known for their fidelity, their attention to the Old Testament Hebrew word of God. Hmm. Um, so, you, you know, you, you put that all together and woke Marxism is um, not just anti-scriptural and anti-Christian, it's also anti-human being because of its continual revolution against authority. Woke Marxists don't recognize anybody's authority, though they're certainly happy to grab the power when they can take it. Uh, but but they are very interested in hmm, um, in in complete rebellion against all authority, capital A authority to begin with, and any vestige of that. Why the rebellion against the opening paragraph of the Declaration of Independence? Because of the authority of the Creator there, the universal authority of the Creator. Um, these people are anarchists anarchists. Uh, and when we remember that the word arche is used in the opening of John's gospel, hmm. uh, right? An arche ein ha logos. We usually translate that beginning. It could be translated uh, the ultimate authority or the first principle of everything. Wow. Uh, you see, that's anarchy. And, and it's, it's, it's bloody, murderous, violent, hateful anarchy. Why in the world would we want to invite even a, 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 a little bit of uh, something or another from that into a Lutheran university or a Lutheran congregation or a Lutheran church body? Why would any human being want to invite that stuff in, much less those of us who know the value of every human being because of God's incarnation in Christ and his death and resurrection for every single person? I want to take it, it's, just, it's just outrageous. I, I want to just so just. I'm going to put a, maybe a bow on this conversation. I want to take up the, that philosophy of language as the kind of starting point for our, our next conversation. And we're, and we're hoping yeah. to have three of these. But I, so I, let me give, me give you a theory and attempt to answer your question. So why would anyone do this? And so, so I'm, I'm going to test this, and I'm going to quote Nietzsche to sound smart. And then so, so <laughs> I can try to sneak past you here. Uh, <laughs> Because I think something is happening. Uh, so, the, um, the, that this this ideology does not appear as dangerous as it really is, because it's covered over by Christian ethical momentum. So uh, it's 
now I, someone told me this this last week, so I didn't. But Nietzsche, in his um, well, in the Gay Science, talks about <laughs> how the shadow of the Buddha stayed on the wall for a hundred years after Buddha died. Is that how it goes? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> and so I think that I. So is that is that the argument from Nietzsche? That is that is that the implications of of Christian thought of of the bib of the of the biblical authority the implications remain at, even after the the underpinning is is collapsed so you 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 destroy the foundation but it's almost like a wily e. coyote commercial or, or a cartoon you know he runs out and he before he falls there's a delay before the collapse and we're in that delay of the collapse the shadow of the buddha is still on the wall the the momentum of christianity is still there we still think that there's a right and a wrong, a good and a bad, even though we have no philosophical uh, uh, underpinning to to hold that up, and so so we've we've kind of skirted on that momentum. But here's my maybe sec- so that would be my first argument is why is because we don't see the real danger of a thing because it's a wolf in sheep's clothing, the sheep's clothing of the, the Buddha shadow there. But my second idea is that it's starting to. The, f- the shadow is starting to fade and people are starting to realize, hey, if the whole world is nothing but matter, everything's deterministic, everything's nihilistic, every- there's no spirit at all, there's no logos, there's nothing, then, then th- it's an unendurable meaninglessness. It doesn't just set us free from the commandments we want to be set free from, like don't commit adultery and don't have other gods. Here's another Nietzsche picture. It unchanges. It unchanges. Chains us from the sun, and it flings us off into oblivion. And that people are starting to realize this. So just in the last few months, a number of major atheistic thinkers have said, "Well, I'm not an atheist anymore. It's untenable. I can't be. I'm not a Christian yet, but I wish I was. And everyone should be because Christ is our only hope." Uh, so, so there's so there's two theses for you to maybe wrestle with, I suppose. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, so, I'm I'm going to be a little rude and say I would like to have that conversation about society in general or people that we meet on the street, but that's not really what I'm here for today. So, what I'm here for today is to talk about this within the Lutheran Church and in our Lutheran universities. So, here comes the rude part. Um, that description is 50 years out of date. That was taking place at the time of Seminex in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. When when Kurt Marquardt in Anatomy of an Explosion, uh, he talks about this in chapter five, uh, and everybody should be rereading that right about now. Uh, He says that the problem with the the incursion of this, this horrible, speaking about raising walls, this hermeneutic or way of interpreting the Bible, right? Putting a wall between the pastor and the scriptural text, between the person and her Bible, right? That was going on at St. Louis. Um, he says that that this is due to critical theory. That's his that's his vocabulary, and he's not talking about something that's really picky. He's talking about the Marxist stuff. All right, so. 50 years ago, before our colleges decided that they were going to become universities modeled after the secular universities in the United States, the formerly religious places like Harvard and whatnot, right? Before that, or maybe it's around the time, but before that really took hold, Marquardt was saying, look, the problem here is that the social sciences on which this lousy hermeneutic that's being taught at St. Louis is based, the social sciences do not have any room for authoritative texts. What does that mean? That means no learning can take place. And and what it really means is the Bible is not being read and followed. No room for authoritative texts. Now, why in the world didn't we pick up the hint there, and say, okay, so how are we going to be sure 
that all of our colleges and our universities and our grade schools and our high schools remain faithful to God and his word. How, what are we going to do? We did just about nothing except to kind, kind, of, kind of go along with the uh, departments of education in our education departments and all of this stuff. So here's the real problem. It is everything that you said, but it's something that if anybody should have caught this, it should have been the confessional Lutherans because we're all about the means by which that foundation comes into our curricula and comes into our lives. This woke Marxism is fundamentally an assault on the means of grace. That's our terminology in the church. And that's exactly the problem with the Concordias. Um, <laughs> I think, we, I think we, I so this is, you know, I'm in seminary in 2000. I'm, I went to seminary yeah. 2001 to 2005, had Dr. Mark Wood. Uh, the, the story of Seminex was that we survived. We, we made it. We were able to hold the institution to biblical fidelity and those who were fighting against it, they're out. They're now with the ELCA or whatever. So, so this, this, um, I think this is why, at least from my perspective, why we weren't like, oh, we need to go and, and we need to go check the foundations. We need to go under the house and see if the if the beams are falling apart. We thought, no, we did it. We 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 kicked out all the all the progressive liberals, and now we're okay again. And I, I so I think that's how is that. Um, do you think does that make sense for the? And it was I think a mythology as you're pointing out that we it wasn't we didn't. We didn't carve out the rotted wood. Um, we just picked up a couple of the termites. But, um, but that's, I think, to answer your question, why we didn't go and, and kind of revisit the top-down educational structures. Because we thought we, we succeeded because we handled it, and maybe because we handled it in a political way. Um, so, Yeah, so uh, I have a little longer stretch into the year, days of yore than you do. So... I was in high school in 74, graduating from high school, um, and I was not in the LCMS, but certainly was watching because I came from an LCMS church and family and, and so forth. Uh, but what, what, I'm, what I'm saying is, here we are now. I'm not a church historian, as you know. Um, I'm talking about the, the um, reality of this. Had Marquardt saying, plain as day, that the problem with the hermeneutics at one of our seminaries was the undue or maybe the influence of social sciences. Now, what, what's going on? I don't see that it was dealt with really at all, or certainly not, not anywhere after you know the, the uh, sigh of relief that things seem to have been corrected right at the time, uh, because what what tack did our Concordia universities take? I can speak only with some familiarity with Concordia, Wisconsin. The recently retired president there followed church growth theory for growing the university. Church growth theory is based on the social sciences. It's based on the metrics, the demographics, the measures of success that come from, well, uh, sometimes from psychology or uh, social this or social that, right? And not from the Word of God. That's been going on. What about, um, what about the the uh, questions about things in our congregations? Uh, and and what what really are we insisting on with those who come into seminary? What kind of backgrounds do they have to have? Um, I don't say this with any delight, and I wasn't one of. I just wasn't here wasn't here to be saying we have to do more. I'm saying it now, though. Alas, time to lament. Uh, we're, we're not doing the job even now. If, I, I, I know that uh, uh, Concordia Seminary Fort Wayne just just was having their uh, annual January seminars right now, and I, I heard that the 50th anniversary of Seminex was kind of a theme. Um, Okay, it just sounds a little odd to me. The, the question, though, is um, what are we doing right now? Here's a bit of irony for you. Concordia University, Wisconsin, awarded Kurt Marquardt an honorary doctorate 
uh, several years ago, and and I said in the uh, in memoriam to to Professor Marquardt in the introduction of my book, I said, you know, that was certainly a, a rightly deserved honor, but I don't think that the president and board of regents then were paying any attention to Marquardt and his writing, and I know that they're not today. Otherwise, this stuff wouldn't be going on. So the the point is to address this ex and what is happening, as I have said, and you know, if I can be proved wrong, please go ahead. What's what's happening is woke Marxism is happening, and Lutherans are welcoming it, this Trojan horse in through the gate. It's not even just a Trojan horse; it's you know, like that stuff that was catapulted into into cities under siege, uh, infected dead animals and stuff. That's what this is, and people want to keep pieces of this. They want, they want to harbor this. They want to have people whose whole job as administrators or program directors is to do woke stuff, woke <laughs> Marxist stuff. Right. Well, I always thought that, so Missouri Senate was always 30 years, 20 years behind on the church growth stuff. So we are always adopting it 20 years later. So maybe there's some, maybe there's some hope in this is that we are, we're behind the curve. It should let us see the, what this all results in. So... We can we can see it clearly, but well, so thanks for thanks for that. I I hope also I haven't listened to the symposium. I it's part of my to do list today. Hopefully they're talking about. Hopefully they're doing what you are doing. Hey, look, we need to understand what was happening back then so that we can so that we can be aware of it today. Um, so I we'll think you'll be able to tell whether whether we are or not doing that by how much attention is paid to Marquardt's writings. Right, that's right, and how much he's honored. I, um, it, I, I miss him. He's, his voice is missed in the church, boy. Uh, yeah. And his, his, his camouflage parachute pants. Did I tell you, the first time I met Dr. Barcourt, it was at a, like the opening, it was a barbecue before classes start, and he was wearing these huge, big, baggy, baggy camouflage, and he's, I think he's, what, 75 years old, and he's wearing these parachute camouflage, it was great. Uh, Probably all the rage in Australia, and, and uh, <laughs> as is happening with me, too, I don't really care about fashion anymore, but, uh, oh, you know. Phenomenal. Well, I, I became a pastor, I tell you, I became a pastor, so for two reasons, I, so I wouldn't have to study chemistry, and I would never have to wear a tie. Those are my two, <laughs> the two driving factors. Well, thank you for this, this is great start to the conversation. I'm looking forward to the next ones. Uh, thanks for the book, too. Is it? It's uh, on Amazon and people can get it? Anatomy of an... Yes, it's all over the place. Okay. So Barnes & Noble has it, all of the Amazons. So if folks are, are hearing you from uh, mission fields or overseas countries, uh, whether it's French or, or Spanish or whatever, all of the Amazons do have it. Um, if a person is looking for the best price in the United States, though you will have to pay shipping, I think, and wait a little longer, um, Christian News or uh, Lutheran News, my publisher has that on, on sale right now as well. And uh, is it okay to mention this? Sure. It's available in print copy as well as in a digital form. Um, so the digital form includes um, a little device where you can let the book read itself for you Nice. Um, as well. And then finally, I wanted to just sandwich in that um, it it may sound like the book is a is, uh, kind of destructive because of taking on this a big issue uh, but the whole purpose here and uh, in a way the reason that I didn't wait until after whatever happens happens is because I didn't want it to be a post-mortem as um, Professor Marquardt's fine book is in other words he wrote that stuff after the fallout of Seminex and I, I would like to help um, mitigate or reduce the carnage from this sort of thing. People need to talk and pray uh, about this. And then finally, um, a, a portion of each book is going to support uh, the confessional classical Lutheran education in Casper, Wyoming, which is due to start in about a year or so. And also, um, I am a, a member in exile of the philosophy department at Concordia University, Wisconsin. It is my belief that uh, the university is is uh, by a kind of neglect trying to destroy the philosophy department. So, part of of the um, revenues also will go to Dr. Manuj, who is the chairman of the department there, directly and exclusively for use to help the students and professors in the philosophy department. Thanks. Uh, and also, and you have a website, LutheranPhilosopher.com. Uh, well, yeah, if it's you more send than a me website. all. 
all, all yeah. that, and we'll put that in the link too, so that you have online classes, you have a lot of That's resources right. available. Yeah. Uh, I, I was able to duck in a couple of times in the last year to your reading group. You're reading through Dostoevsky. Uh, uh, we're we're reading through Kierkegaard right Kierkegaard, now. I think we were right. there for that. Yeah, yeah, that's right, Kierkegaard. And um, do you have do you have by the way an annotated version of or a teaching on the Sultanitsyn "Live Not by Lies" that you could refer yeah. to? Yes, I, I have. Uh, I thought I remembered that narrated PowerPoint series that are headed "Live Not by Lies," and then they look at different uh, features of our life. Okay, and that's that. That's there as well. So we'll put all those links in the description yeah. so people can get a hold of you and see this work that you're doing. That'll be really great. Uh, Dr. Well, Charles, thank you for this start, and we'll uh, see you again. Uh, we'll see you again soon for the next conversation. Thank you, brother. Appreciate it.